All right, we're back. <laughs> we're back. It's 3.15, and we're back for 2021 MSU Comics Forum Online. Uh, again, we'd like to thank our participants. Uh, our roundtable number four is Comics Add In of History. Again, I want to thank our participants for their flexibility this year of this uh, roundtable. Uh, was originally a panel who we asked to, could you switch over to a roundtable format. Um, they were they were um, nice enough to do so, and I am not going to take up any more of their time. Instead, I'm going to turn it over to the, the, the moderator, um, uh, Marianne Metz, and say take it away. And we will be monitoring the chat, of course. If you're watching on the stream, and you have questions for our presenters. And after they have their, their conversation, we will make sure they get, they get to you, do them. And so Marianne, you're in charge. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, MSU Comics Forum, for, for letting us um, kind of babble with one another today. We're really looking forward to it. So good afternoon. I'm Marianne Rett, Professor of History at Monmouth University and um, moderator as well as participant for today's roundtable, Comics in As of History. Um, this roundtable has sort of a backstory. We were sitting in a hotel lobby in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 2019 between sessions at the World History Association's annual conference. Caleb and I uh, indulged in a prolonged discussion about, the his about history and about comics. It was part serious questioning uh, and part kvetching. Um, and our discussion revolved around sort of two broad themes. One, comics as of and in history and how this as a field or, or maybe as a subfield began, um, is making huge strides, but still has a long way to go. And then second, the periodization that we tend to rely on when we talk about the history of comics is so amazingly inadequate for what we as historians, especially as world historians, seek to do in our work with comics. For my part, I was struggling with uh, aligning my own thinking with terms that are in common usage about history as a part of the, about comics as a part of the historical field. I found that when I talk to someone about doing comics and history, one of the things that comes to mind is either that they think I'm writing history as a comic, a la Trevor Getz or Andrew Kirk, who have indeed done just that with the Oxford University Press graphic history series. On some level, this is not, this is not surprising. Graphic histories are experiencing a bit of a renaissance right now. And many folks who aren't knee deep in the his, in history of comics uh, must think that this is a natural outcome of these two ideas brought together. Alternatively, some may assume that this means that we work in detail on the history of comics themselves, often coupled with an assumption that we work on specific series or publishers um, and that we are looking more at uh, the creator, the creators, the editors, and the publishing houses, rather than maybe specific panels or storylines. And of course, um, what is masterful EC comics may be considered part of that genre of um, analysis. To this, I typically say yes, yes, but wait, there's more. Um, for my part, I'm particularly interested in looking at comics as an archive of the historical record. And if we expand that record beyond um, just the boundaries of sort of the superhero age, we can draw a history of time and place from when they were published or produced, which offers us uh, a historiography that can be added to the already robust canon more common from monographs. For this example, I pull um, J. Carol Mansfield, who was a leader in history comic genre in this country between the 1920s and 40s, when he produced over, well over a thousand history comics, largely focused on US and European history, but he also dabbled in world history and thematic histories like technology and fashion. Mansfield's comics were intended to introduce audiences, both K-12 and older, to uh, various elements of the historical record. They were limited by the way the historical record was largely presented at the time and thus reflect the history of the history of the discipline. 
Um, Mansfield's work beca becomes therefore a fabulous understanding of historiography as well. Um, and here we have this example discussing the Holy Alliance, which is leading us up to a discussion further of the Monroe Doctrine later on. But of course, at the very end in that last panel, it, he, we have Uncle Sam pointing to America for Americans, also leading to a whole host of questions linking these ideas about what it means to be American to not only the 1920s when this was published, but to the century preceding it, and of course now the century that has followed it. Circling back to the question is questions of periodization as well, in learning to articulate my own research, I've come to understand that the periodization we tend to rely on to talk about comics is woefully limited. I'm just going to focus on one element here. As a world historian, I typically find the American-centric uh, go-to of golden and silver ages very frustrating because they reinforce American exceptionalism and the American exceptionalism quality of the history of comics. Uh, simultaneously giving supremacy to more recent records and giving less interest to the decades and centuries that had come before. Moreover, francophone comics or manga come with their own periodizations, which then silo those epicenters from one another. But we know that they were all in, con in conference with one another, influencing and manipulating, manipulating one another in a global dialogue. And to this end, I hope that today's discussion will allow us to explore many of these ideas further through our conversation and hopefully the conversation with the audience. Beth. Thanks, Mary Ann. Uh, well, you laid the groundwork perfectly. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Pollard, professor of history at San Diego State University and co-leader of Comics at SDSU, an interdisciplinary collaborative focused on comics teaching, research, creation, and outreach. Now, my goal as a part of this panel today is to talk about how comic studies can help ancient historians apply a new lens for seeing very old things. So Marianne was talking about the periodization and needing to reach back centuries before and, and thinking about a bigger picture, a different way of dividing. Uh, so we ancient historians need help. So periodization. Let's take a quick look at some sequential art across millennia. Now, each of these examples, a couple of which I imagine you recognize from Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, um, each of these benefit from comics analysis into issues such as time, uh, motion, paneling, color, text image combination, meaning making in the margins. I mean, essentially all of the comics analytical tools uh, can help to interpret this kind of material. Uh, so across the top of this slide, the Chauvet Cave, dating back to 30,000 years before the present, uh, with its various animal groupings and how they interact with one another. The Tomb of Manav from the 14th century BCE, with its depiction of agricultural labor. Uh, Neo-Assyrian reliefs from the 8th century BCE that uh, compare or combine text and image uh, in order to proclaim imperial power. Uh, in the second row here, some of you may recognize Trajan's column from the second century CE, you know, with its carvings that spiral up 115 feet into the air, uh, showing uh, Roman defeat of the Dacians. Uh, uh, to the uh, right here in the second column, we've got what's called P. Oslo I, which is a fourth century magical handbook that combines word and image in ways that beg debate over, you know, are they duo specific, are they parallel, are they interdependent? Uh, uh, the third column, I've, I'm sure you all recognize the Bayou Tapestry and the Mixtec Codex, uh, the Zush Natal uh, from 1000 to 1200 CE. So all of these examples, and you know, just scattered uh, uh, examples, uh, tell us that comics periodization needs to go further back uh, and usefully because uh, comics terminology, comics conversations could help us understand these materials uh, in, in more nuanced and dynamic ways. Uh, now, Marianne already mentioned the traditional periodization of comics into you know, gold, silver, bronze, modern. Uh, 
Uh, many of you may also know that periodization scheme leans into a model that actually comes from antiquity. Uh, eighth century uh, poet uh, Hesiod, so from 2,700 years ago, who tracked the decline of humanity from its gold to its silver to its bronze age into the age of heroes and the disappointing iron age in which he himself lived. Uh, so it, it's kind of ironic, right? The, the period that gives us this, um, or the distant past that gives us this problematic model doesn't have its own model for thinking about comics. Uh, so if we're gonna allow that these different types of deliberately juxtaposed images uh, uh, and texts are gonna count as comics, we need a much more nuanced temporal framing. Uh, so then the question of course becomes, and hopefully we can talk about this in the Q&A, based on what, right? Based on material, is it a stone age, a bark and skin age, a fabric and thread age? You know, I, we need to think about that. But any categorization would be better than just calling it pre-Topfer or you know, pre-modern. Uh, so we need a model that can account for diversity of expression uh, and the medium on which that expression happens. And now very briefly, two other questions I wanna throw into the mix for today. Uh, another challenge for ancient historians uh, shared with our counterparts who do more modern history is teasing out, Marian already mentioned this, teasing out the difference between comics about the distant past and comics from the distant past. Uh, so take for instance, Eric Schenauer's Age of Bronze as compared with Trojan war scenes that play out on what are called the tabellae iliacae. Uh, ancient historians would do really well to pick up on comic studies approaches to analyzing visual storytelling. Uh, modern comics consumers use an incredibly nuanced vocabulary uh, in their consumption of graphic novels like Shanauer's. So how do we turn that trained eye to antiquity uh, to get more meaning? Uh, so, so something I wanna talk about in the Q&A. And then finally, even more briefly, uh, for those of us who know the ancient materials well and see themes, characters, and ideas from antiquity appear in modern comics, uh, how close or explicit do echoes need to be in order to count as borrowing? Yeah, most would agree that something like Hippolyta's Athena given future telling magic sphere uh, would count as intentional borrowing that, that would benefit from analysis. Uh, but what about subtler borrowing, right? Uh, uh, for instance, a variation on the theme of creepy witchy old woman guiding a younger woman, negotiating the difficulties of romantic relationships uh, with childbearing and making her way in the workplace. And no, I'm not talking about Scarlet Witch and Agatha, although I could be, uh, <laughs> but rather talking about the more generic way that comics from the 1950s and 60s picked up on Roman themes of how witches operated and what made them so subversive. So a lot to think about, periodization, source material and reception. And I'm looking forward to talking more about that uh, when we open up for broader discussion. Good afternoon, everyone from Sacramento, California. My name is Caleb Knobloch. I'm a PhD candidate in modern European history at the University of California, Davis. And for my uh, brief piece today, I wanted to talk about historical thinking through world history comics. Um, we can advance to the next slide, please. So I wanna talk about three things uh, as they relate to historical thinking uh, and, and even teaching historical thinking skills um, using comic books. Um, the first, is the use of narrative and implotment in comics and how this applies to historical writing as well. Um, as I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with the work of Hayden White, and his work, Meta History. Um, he talks about the role of implotment um, in creating histories, that is to say, um, either consciously or unconsciously, uh, creating a using a narrative structure um, drawn from literature to tell historical events based on the relationship between the mode of argument and the mode of ideology. Uh, some examples uh, I've put up on the screen here. Um, what does this have to do with comic books? Comic books are explicitly created stories, uh, even uh, comics that deal with uh, empirical historical fact or uh, historical periods. Um, I have an example here that I'll talk a bit about in a little bit of detail um, from a graphic novel called A Chinese Life uh, by Li Kunwu and Philippe Autier. Um, which documents uh, Lee's life uh, growing up in 
under the Cultural Revolution in China, uh, and his graphic novel uh, extends all the way through the reforms of the Deng Xiaoping period um, up to uh, the year 2010 um, through these three volumes. I chose this example because point number two, um, this is a, as I mentioned, a self-aware example of a graphic history. Um, this is not an, any attempt to um, hide behind empiricism. Um, this is a story that Li wants you to know is coming from a particular ideological perspective um, and his own personal experiences that won't necessarily match up with the way that another person would tell uh, their same biography, um, even if they came from the same uh, region around Gun Gunming uh, that Li himself did. Um, and finally, I want to talk about this uh, comic as an, as an example of a world history comic. Uh, Marianne mentioned before that there's a, a preference toward Anglo-centrism and the United States in these comics. Um, my example here, and thank you for advancing the slide, my example here um, is a collaboration between a Chinese artist and a French uh, graphic novel and comic book creator, um, originally published in French. It's been translated into a number of languages. Um, see the uh, original French titles up here. Um, but this text uh, struck me as quite interesting because of its kind of palimpsestal nature, um, this blending of uh, linguistic traditions, of cultures, um, of different ways of storytelling, even through uh, what is ostensibly a single graphic novel format. So that's what we're gonna talk about uh, for the next couple of minutes. Uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. So uh, comics like Lee's uh, demystify objectivity in historical graphic novels. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, there's no attempt to make this uh, uh, some sort of dry chronicle uh, of a person's life. Um, Lee is pointing you to episodes in his life that he thinks are particularly interesting, important, or salient to, uh, well, the narrative of China. Uh, he's, he's linking his own uh, individual biography with a, a biography of a new nation. Um, created as as this comic argues, um, really in the in the chaos and destruction of the Cultural Revolution, uh, we get a little glimpse at that here on the, the bottom right hand corner of this page. Um, I believe the next slide will zoom in a little bit. There we go. That uh, we see Lee here as a young boy um, who is being spoken to by his future self uh, in in about the year 2010, uh, as he's holding uh, his his school book. Um, telling the young boy that someone from the 21st century um, wants to uh, tell your story, that we are we are uh, not trying to recreate the past through this graphic novel. Um, this is a, a presentist interpretation for an audience in the 21st century. So we see this kind of uh, meta, uh, this kind of uh, meta analysis of what this comic book is going to do in a very simple uh, panel. Next slide, please. And in this book, um, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail here. Uh, I think that'll probably be better served in our discussion, but I just wanted to point out a couple features that I thought made this book particularly interesting um, as, a, as a source for graphic world histories. Um, first is this uh, blending of linguistic styles. Um, unlike many translated comic books, right, which you know, perhaps they're written in, in French or Mandarin or uh, whatever whatever original language and translated entirely into a new language for a new audience. Um, Lee and OTA do not do that. Um, instead, they have a blending of languages um, that in some ways uh, challenges the reader to struggle through um, vocabularies that they're not familiar with, through artistic traditions that they're not familiar with. Um, that to understand the story in its in its totality, you have to be able to uh, both read the dialogue that has been translated for you, as well as the important news announcements. For example, here uh, on the left hand side, um, that are promote that are discussing propaganda uh, about children uh, in the countryside. Uh, and without that, the story uh, not only doesn't quite make sense narratively, um, but you're missing out on important historical context that informs both Lee's life and the cultural changes that are going on um, in the 1950s and 60s in China. So that's all I have for right now. Um, I'll, I'll leave these to percolate for a little bit and then we can get to uh, some of these themes and questions in the discussion. Thank you.
All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Lawrence Abrams. I'm also a PhD candidate at UC Davis, uh, coming to you today from Portland, Oregon, actually. Um, and I want to announce right now that I am part of the problem. Uh, I am, by training and specialty, at least when it comes to comics, an Anglo-American modern specialist, um, with a particular focus on nationalism. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the thing is, we have to consider when discussing the periodization of comics in particular, as Marianne and Beth both pointed out, um, there's a focus on the Anglo-American tradition, and particularly the American tradition that privileges this gold, silver, bronze age, now modern age construction. Um, and yes, we absolutely need to expand that backwards to the pre-gold age sequential art form. Uh, what I'm mostly going to be talking about today, though, is the problems with the format as it exists now, actually even addressing the, the periodization as we understand it. Um, for instance, we tend to think of comics, particularly from the Bronze Age onward, as starting to integrate more social concerns, more politics, more current events. Uh, and when we actually came up with the initial idea for this panel, my paper presentation was going to be heavily on current event responsive comics. Now, we don't have time for that here today, but I wanted to focus at least on when that trend begins in the 1970s. In 1970, in particular, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, uh, the very famous hard traveling heroes runs, uh, gets a lot of news and a lot of press at that time for its responsiveness to social issues. And that reaches its height in October of 1971 with, as you can see here on the screen, Snowbirds Don't Fly, uh, in which you can see Green Arrow's uh, sidekick, Speedy, turns out to be a heroin junkie. Uh, this was a big deal at the time as comics uh, had not been allowed under the Comics Code Authority to portray drugs until only a couple months earlier uh, with Green Goblin Reborn, which was actually not a private initiative. Stan Lee wrote Green Goblin Reborn at the request of the US Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, as it was known as at the time. Nowadays, what would be uh, HHS? Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Now, these comics are the first crack in the wall, the um, forlorn hope, if you will. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, the result of which, though, ultimately leads to what we now think of as the Bronze Age, um, once famously described as having reached its uh, ultimate expression in 1973 with the death of Gwen Stacy in, in Spider-Man. But the problem is this. We take it for granted that the Bronze Age ended and now has been replaced with a modern age. Uh, we usually assign this to 1985. It's usually frequently given credit to uh, stories like Watchmen and Dark Knight. And it's very gritty. It's dark. It's uh, frequently traumatizing. Uh, for the characters in it and for the readers if you get them too young like I did. Um, now, the problem with that is dark elements in comics had always been there under the guise of the Comics Code Authority or not, despite the resurgence of horror comics as the code starts to break down in, in the Bronze Age, darker elements and socially responsive themes are there in the Bronze Age. So what really separates out the modern age at all? I would argue that our problem begins in, a, in identifying the grimdark or the gritty elements as what separates them. When re in, realistically, I would argue, more of what separates them is the publication method and ownership. And we've tended to privilege in Anglo-American traditions, and I do say Anglo-American, uh, given how the British industry was dominated by American publishers well into the early aughts um, due to the post-war paper rationing problems and frankly, just commercial distribution rights well into the 80s. But the breaking up of the creator monopolies, the foundation of Dark Horse and Image and other independent publishers out from under the wings of Marvel and DC, I would argue is more what classifies our modern age, if anything at all. And I'm not really sure, and I'm perfectly happy to discuss this. I know I'm lobbing a grenade here. But I'd love to discuss what we can think of as a modern age other than that, because the grim, dark, and the gritty Maybe not so much. Socially responsive issues, that's in the Bronze Age already. Public-private partnerships, certainly Green Goblin proves that that was already there. Public service announcements in comics date back to World War II. The other thing I would argue is the privilege of the modern age is the crossover. While small-scale cr crossovers did exist prior to the 1980s, they do become much more prevalent afterwards. And I would argue that this is actually one of our defining features for the modern age. But again, this doesn't speak to historical content or responsiveness in the comics. 
this is also one of the other problems I frequently see when discussing the modern, modern age, because the modern age, if it started in 1985, has now gone on for more than twice the length of any other so-called age of comics. They average about 10, 15 years, and the modern age is already well more than that. So are we in a, dare I say it, and I really don't want this to be true, postmodern age? And if so, what do we call that? Um, the next slide, please. Now, Adrian Resha, uh, we were just talking about this before the panel began. Adrian Resha has come up with a great uh, term, blue age, to discuss the digital delivery of comics. But again, that's methodology rather than necessarily content. Um, she also touches on increased representation of minorities, which I think is something worth discussing in the uh, discussion period as well. One trend I want to focus on, though, that I think may be under-examined in our, let's say, iridium age, uh, if we're going to stick with periodic elements here, uh, is the trend to look at flaws in our system, not just socially responsive uh, comics, but the idea that no one is necessarily above reproach. Even in the Bronze Age or the modern age, there was always the one good detective. There was always the one upstanding politician. Frequently in post 9-11 comics, and I do say post 9-11 for a reason, as you saw in the last panel, uh, J. Michael Straczynski's Amazing Spider-Man uh, and the falling of the two towers. Post 9-11, I would argue you see a shift towards moral ambiguity rather than grim, dark, and gritty, and rather than upstanding singular characters. Uh, notably, you'll find, uh, particularly as we move forward in time towards the present, uh, Union Jack, London Falling, which is a particular favorite of mine, uh, in which there are terrorists, but the government is doing as much damage as perhaps the terrorists are. Uh, if in the uh, panel on the left there, you can see the Sheriff of Babylon from DC and Vertigo comics, which is about as morally ambiguous as it comes. There are no good guys in the Baghdad green zone as uh, Tom King and Mitch Gerrits would tell us in that comic. Um, and you do still see some images of American exceptionalism, as you can see there in 2017's Green Arrow clip. But the moral ambiguity throughout, as you'll notice, Green Arrow is lecturing the crowd that no one has stood up the way they were supposed to, that this crowd, somewhat prescient, as you can see, it's a riot on the Capitol steps in 2017, that this particular riot, prescient as it may have been, is built from our own problems, that we have, there is no truth, there's only propaganda, there's no honor, there's only profit, as he shouts to the crowd. This, I would argue, at least content-wise, would be our defining turn post 9-11, um, whether it's the, through the war on terrorism and the jadedness that comes from that, or through other factors, I'd be happy to discuss. Um, but if we are going to seriously discuss periodization, in addition to examining the global nature of it and extending it backwards through time, we need to also understand that the modern age has a problem. Uh, next slide, please. That being said, I would argue there is one defining feature of all comics that our periodization works just fine with. It's always okay to punch a Nazi. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lawrence. That was an excellent way to, to end the individual discussions, I think. Um, so I, I think we've obviously got a lot we can, we can talk about here. And I think... Um, while I want to get back to the prepositions issue, I think we've we've done a good job of um, teeing up this this periodization question, and I want to ask you all if you if you have thoughts on what factors we need to bring under the tent, right? Um, when we talk about periodization, I, I think that I have a tendency personally to find frustration over the fact that periodization is largely tied to the superhero really only, right? And that as a result, everything else kind of falls outside of it. So, you know, we're talking here about graphic histories. Well, if these are comics, again, we have to talk about definitions here, what's a comic, um, where do they fit in these periodizations, right? Um, do we put Mouse, do we put Abena, do we put all of these comics in those same periods and, and why or why not? So I'm, I'm sort of curious to hear what your thoughts on, maybe if you have thoughts on like what a period should be, maybe something you want to propose or, or talk through this a little bit. And Beth, I'm going to 
actually ask you first since you're our, our uh, oldest examiner, you know, in, the, in that you're examining the oldest materials. I love it. I've turned 50 next week and all of a sudden I'm the ancient <laughs> we, we and do, the oldest. We can do this on seniority. Yes, exactly. So, uh, okay. So in terms of periodization, uh, yeah, obviously historians, we throw this term around uh, and just to make sure everyone knows what it means, it means you're sort of chunking time into meaningful groupings so that you can say something about what happened in that period of time, right? So periodization is a tool for making sense of time and an area of study. Uh, and so uh, you know, every field has its own way of chunking up time. Uh, now, as someone who works with the ancient world, I'm, I'm trained as a Roman historian. Yeah, I've been to comics panels over years and years, uh, and it always bothered me that I would see people talk about comics and talk about what was going on in the modern the modern age, you know, by which I mean you know, 1900s and later. Uh, and I would think, you know, we have that in ancient Rome. Why isn't anyone talking about what's happening in ancient Rome? Uh, and so in terms of periodization, I, I, I feel like we need to think about what is, you know, a meaningful chunk of time within which to study something that's happening. But in order to do that, we need to think about what questions are we asking of the thing that we're studying. Uh, so, um, so yeah, questions with questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so yeah, it, it, other people, I, I mean, just as the ancient historian, I always feel like I'm sort of trying to drag this idea of comics <laughs> back <laughs> before, you know, 1850, uh, just to get into the conversation. So, yeah. And that, that ties in well with a question that I've already seen in, mm -hmm. the, in the chat that um, there's this idea of, should we be applying this word comics to stuff from the the you know 2000 years ago or even 300 years ago should we be using that same term retroactively can yeah, i be the obnoxious I mean... etymologist who says those are greek and latin terms right <laughs> i i looked it up yeah I, <laughs> during the talk i was sorry if i was i have my giant you know greek lexicon here this massive book and uh, yeah i mean these are greek and latin terms right so if we want to do it that way uh yeah but i'm sorry Lawrence, you were going to say something yeah no it, i think it's just uh, i mean as i as i mentioned my particular area of specialty being nationalist comics um you know, not for this presentation, but for one of our previous collaborations, you all may recall uh, that Commando comics I had with the Rock of Gibraltar. Anyway, this comic for those of our, uh, our attendees is a history of the Rock of Gibraltar, but it was written in 2006. It was a popular mass publication comic, but it was entirely a history told through the, I swear to God, the point of view of a lone stranded commando and his pet Barbary ape. Do we treat that the same way as a graphic memoir or a graphic history when it is done quite specifically as a historical retelling, um, when it is, however, not in the least academic as, as a, a true Oxford series graphic history would be? Um, I think it's worth talking about that in connection with going back into Beth's uh, sort of, I don't know, what do we call it? the Rugium age, the, the Indium age? We need better terms here, of course, you're, all, you're right. Um, but the idea of at what point is it a graphic history? Is it a history of graphic? This is something that we've been batting around ourselves since that uh, conversation in Puerto Rico. Um, but, but I think uh, ultimately Beth's right. We have to as assume at least some of these comics and sequential art terms have to be pushed back that far. We're not the first one to suggest this. I know McLeod and Gibbs and some of the others ha have done so. Um, but you I just throw we, it out there as an idea. Like, right. We need, a standard, we need a standardization. Yeah. yeah. I, Caleb, I want to also ask you in particular, you know, the Francophone world has a tremendously powerful uh, history in comics, right? But we don't use the same periodization with them. They're, you know, we return to the siloing that we've got going on. And, and your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think two, two things come to mind. First, um, on the usage of the term comics, it really comes down to the mode of analysis, right? Like, if we're using the the tools, the vocabulary, the 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 literature of, of comic studies uh, to look into a you know, to look at a, a historical period, to look at the Bayou Tapestry and and to read it in a new and different way, 
well, it's a comic because we're we're using the tools of of comics analysis, right? That, that I think that that seems a pretty easy way to 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 square that circle. Um, and then on, on the for the francophone world, um, it it's been curious to me how the how that discussion operates kind of in parallel with the American one. Mm-hmm. Um, there are also there they have the same debates over you know when did when did this thing start that we call a comic and did it begin with top for we don't really like that because he's Swiss. Um, so <laughs> looking for looking for French, you know, looking for like a French origin, um, almost kind of building their own exceptionalism. Um, you know, this is this is a, an outmoded form of, of, of discourse, but but that's sort of where it where it starts. Um, but you do see similar attempts to try to find this meaningful way to 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 group uh, periods of comic time together. Um, perhaps the most successful, in my opinion, has been looked by art style. Mm-hmm. Right there's a there's a clear periodization of the to <laughs> repeating the word of the clear line style that you see in Ten Ten, right mm-hmm. and and sort of there's there's when there's when Hergé begins the clear line style and, and everything that sort of follows in that mold, well it's part of that periodization. Um, so maybe we could so to to offer a, another suggestion, um, looking at the the comics material in terms of a particular style in terms of a, a kind of ideology if i can go back to to hayden white um you know what are these comics supposed to do i think that allows us to stretch our our rubber band of comics analysis quite far um depending on uh, you know how you want to to um approach the the intent and and you know the, the purpose the audience the technique of the comics i, I think I, I actually quite like that. I do I do see one particular problem though, of course, which is the further forward we get, that that will start to break down the moment you start seeing art styles get moved around. In I'm going to use modern in the historical sense, modern as opposed to modern age of comics. Once you have mass publishing, simply once you have the borrowing of techniques, because I I agree with, with Caleb. There's a great deal of dissent from Tintin, and it certainly sets a mold. But I'm thinking in particular of the Brazilian art school or the Spanish art school that was stolen whole hog by British comics arts creators, um, not out of an intent for theft, but because it was subcontracted. And so decades of British comics, which are born out of these Spanish or Brazilian art styles, which do not bear a descent from Tintin, even though their content is clearly of that kind and descent. Um, but simply because Spanish and Brazilian artists were cheaper and the comics publishers didn't want to pay them so much, the art doesn't bear that resemblance. And Lawrence, I love the fact that you brought up the issue of consumers, right? Mass consumption. And to what extent does that matter for uh, the periodization and the definition of what is a comic? I, I agree with Caleb, and I love how Caleb pointed out, you know, if you're using the modes of analysis, if, if the terminology, if the way of thinking is helping you to understand what you're looking at, you know, whether it's technically a comic or not, you know, is beside the point. Uh, but that issue of how many people are seeing it, how many people are consuming it seems to matter. You take something like the Chauvet Caves or the Tomb of Mana, nobody really saw those, right? They were created, uh, and the only people who saw them were the creators. Uh, but then you get to something like Trajan's Column, right in the middle of uh, Trajan's Forum, just off the Roman Forum, everybody was supposed to see that. Uh, everybody who uh, went to the the palace of the Neo-Assyrian king saw those tribute images. So is there something about mass consumption that matters for uh, factoring into our periodization? I think, I think that's something to uh, fold in. It's a great point. Thanks. I really like the point that Caleb is making about the art styles element. Um, of course, it, it also adds adds complexity too, because you have moments where there isn't uniformity across time and space, right? Or uh, across space, I think, where people are trying out new things. And I'm thinking in particular about what is often referred to as the platinum age, you know, that turn of the century stuff, even just in the US, you look at the way comics are being um, written in the US newspapers, and you've got styles that are very clearly influenced by the Germans, styles that are very clearly influenced by the French and by the British and, you know, and, and even by the Japanese, you know, you can really 
dig into this and we can see that there is there's not uniformity yet but uniformity will emerge partly because of the war partly because of other things um so maybe these periods are also marked sometimes by uniformity and sometimes by divergence i would also want to supplement with that that the idea that uniformity is naturally occurring on its own needs some nuance because a lot of the stuff I look at, of course, with the British material, isn't just British, it's South African, it's it's Burmese, it's, and it's very clearly been an imposed art style. This is not a natively produced art style. Um, I was looking at uh, a couple of years back for a presentation, a, a Burmese comic called Flying Tigers of Rangoon, uh, <laughs> which is horrendous on, on multiple levels for its content and its misogyny, but it's absolutely a product of a certain style of British, comic from the 60s and 70s, simply transplanted to Myanmar. And similar, yeah, Lawrence, you're talking about, you know, put, yeah, transplantation of comic um, ideas. Uh, the same thing was happening along the Silk Roads, right? When you get into 2000 years ago, you have a lot of similar ways of visually telling stories that are showing up in classical Athens, in uh, Imperial Persepolis, uh, even in South Asia, in you know various uh, uh, sculptural programs that show up. Uh, so, so yeah, this this issue of you know, borrowed styles and styles across place um, is useful for thinking about. I've got uh, right behind me here. I've got this this uh, turn of the century French comic uh, Becca scene uh, that sits right in that that uncanny valley between mm -hmm. illustration and comics or bande dessinée and and the, the French literature on on Becca scene doesn't quite know where to put her either. Um, and it, it it really drives home some of these these uh, analytical questions of. Um, you know, where does where does something like this comic fit, which um, on the one hand um, is starting to dispense with the long expository text that you see in something like like an old punch cartoon um, or those mid to late 19th century uh, cartoons. So the, the, the dialogue is, is simplifying in part because it's in a children's book. Um, I, maybe that's something we can pick apart later, um, but it doesn't yet have the the uh, speech bubbles that that seem to, to mark, uh, absolutely, this is a comic, right? Because which the speech bubble is also an American importation. Right, um, yellow French kid. Comics don't pick, right, they don't, they don't, the French comics don't pick up on that um, and, and, and until later. And you see a, a more uniform style of expressing dialogue and narrative um, than, than what uh, Becassine offers. Uh, I hope this isn't too much of a tangent, but I'm also struck how similar this conversation is to uh, to nationalism, you know, we're talking about <laughs> nations. We're talking about you know comics by nation, um, and and I cannot help but wonder, qu'est-ce que c'est un comic here? Um, we you know we we like nationalism. We we tend it's a it's a topic we want to stretch back into the past to try to find the point where the Germans began or the Japanese began, and and the same you know, they're having the same debates about you know can you apply this term to you know pre is late 18th century is that well, is that well, a Ka Ka Caleb let me cut in here then because I <laughs> because I, I will immediately throw the wrench in that because since I'm the one who brought up you know postmodern comic god help me uh I really hate that term please do not let that catch on um but if we're talking about you know comics art styles as nations then we are in a post-nationalist perhaps corporatist era you, you know you'll see behind me on my background i had to do my part as a good you know michigan fan we're at a michigan state event i had to represent with wolverines in the background but it's a marvel comic and there are books out there sold by marvel comics on how to draw the marvel way um and the idea that particularly not just american centric but schooling centric or corporate centric production of comics may have supplanted the national styles to a certain extent. Um, I, and, and this is one of my ongoing problems with, with how we refer to, uh, we've been focusing on this as an art style thing and not, that's great, but we also need to look, I think, still at the content because we get stuck entirely on the art styles. It's very easy to see them directed or steered or imported um, and and the, the content isn't necessarily immune to that either. I love Beth bringing up the whole Hesiod, Heroic Age, Iron Age. Marvel in the early 2000s tried to force 
a new age in the periodization of comics. They started labeling a bunch of their comics in the early 2000s, post 9-11, as the new heroic age of Marvel. And they try, and they there was a whole ad campaign. They tried to push it onto the other publishers, and it didn't take. But we very nearly did have a periodization after modern. It just was corporate pushed, and it didn't work. And and I want to jump in too, and and say that you're absolutely right, Caleb. That I think that this there is that parallel. On the other hand, I also think that, you know, what Beth is talking about, um, about the the using styles and creating new styles, you know, the syncretism that is taking place um, over the history of comics belies the the nationalist narrative. But at the same time, you know, immediately I think of, again, going back to my, my friend, you know, Mansfield. So he's producing this very American-centric history of the U.S. and the world. And up in Canada, they say, oh, that, that's really cool. Let's do that. And so they make their own. And you've got this Canada Hours going on at the same time, you know, sometimes covering the same thing. It's really fun to see, like, the Boston Massacre covered by the Canadians versus the, the Americans and see how different that story, you know, falls out. So in some ways, they very much fall into this nationalist dialogue, not only to become pieces of the nationalist effort, but also as forms of nationalist identity, you know, going back to say, oh, you know, Becca scene, right, is, is French, you know, or is she, you know, right. and, um, but at the same time, it's also how we see the U.S. is not a nation, right, that it's a melting pot or whatever term we want to use right that it's both at the same time well and there's and i'm glad you brought up the canadian stuff marianne there's a truly excellent book it's a couple years old, out now uh, from uh, mississippi university press uh, simply called the canadian alternative um by grace and hoffman uh, which looks at this the very fact that they call it the alternative uh, I think is very telling, frankly, the idea that it's, there has to be a primary then in that case first. Uh, and this is something I run into all the time with my British comics who are the, the local publishers, whether it's Eagle or the collections like in 2000 AD, who are desperate, desperate, desperate to and deliberately trying to get out from under the American shadow, and they just can't. Um, and the idea that the American melting pot may be somewhat carnivorous um, towards other traditions uh, is something they actively discuss. Can, can we swing back to, Lawrence, you made a comment about um, the, the poaching of Spanish and Portuguese mm. artists. Is there something to, to thinking about comics, uh, periodizing comics by a labor regime? I think there absolutely is, yeah. Um, in, and again, this is a, this is a trend. Again, I know less about the francophone tradition, though I know it happens there to a lesser extent too. Um, but Britain, in particular, one of their ways of trying to get out from under the Americans in the early 1970s is when this really takes off. Um, Post-war paper rationing had made comics publication in Britain very expensive, and they outsource the art. The writing is all still British, but the art for almost 15 years is almost entirely Spanish or to a lesser extent Brazilian production. Um, and in a day before PDF scans and even before fax, really, um, that means a lot of labor production offsite, out from under editorial review in many cases, frequently mailing stuff back and forth transatlantic or at least across the channel. Um, and I think it creates a very different labor structure for British comics in, the, in that period than it would for anyone else who's not doing that kind of outsourcing. I know a similar kind of outsourcing exists for a while in Southeast Asia, but I'm less familiar with it. I can't really speak to what kind of labor regime that produces. I wonder though, if that's a much more modern thing. I mean, Beth, again, I'm gonna turn to you and say, yeah. do we see the labor, like who made Trajan's Column, for example? Like the act, who actually did the work? Right, artisans, right? Art artisans mm -hmm. who are tasked with uh, 
uh, you know, telling this story, you were talking about nationalism, this very nationalistic narrative of, of Roman conquest of peoples uh, on the border and beyond. Uh, so, uh, you know, so the work of the artisans funded by the elite, essentially. Um, now, something I wanted to make sure we came back to uh, that Caleb brought up, which is uh, the issue of uh, dual language uh, in a comic and language that can't be read. So the language that's legible to the, the reader, but the language that a reader may not be able to consume. And I think about that a lot with the materials in antiquity, because of course it's a preliterate society. Um, they're reading the images, they're not reading the words, but they know the words mean something, even just the visual of the words mean something. Caleb, did you want to talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. Um... You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my example. Um, you know, something that struck me there, not, there, there, there were sort of two layers in this book, and, and I don't want to just make it a, a book review, but, but there, were, there are kind of two layers here. Um, the first is just the, the existence of these multiple languages, um, and that you, and you, and that you're not, you're not given translations for everything. Um, and even where you are, the translations are, are somewhat limited. So in that entire newspaper, um, which, as best you know, not being a, a not being a reader uh, of Cantonese, I can't tell you for sure. But this appears to, to be actual words, as opposed to the kind of nonsense print that you sometimes see in comics. Um, so there's something written on that page. Of the entire page, we're given just the phrase. Um, paraphrasing, um, Chairman Mao will live for ten thousand years. Right. That's the what the news what the article is reporting is that some. You know, I've, I've got my three year old here, and I, th I think it's a it was a kid about that age that this kid was reportedly saying that in, in fluent uh, Mandarin, and it just you know it was nonsense, right? They, they, but um, but you won't, you're only given that little clip, so you, you you don't have access to the rest of the story and any potential context um, for the rest of the propaganda. Um, you know, now I'm, I'm cherry picking my examples here because I, I want want to find a book that has this kind of linguistic overlap. Um, well, but I, but I think, Caleb, I don't think you're cherry picking at all, if you don't mind if I break in for a second. Yeah, go for it. Um, I think this is actually one of the real things of discussion, again, in a post 9-11 world in a how do we deal with more recent comics. You even look at the big publishers, let alone the small independent ones. Representation of minority groups is on the rise, linguistic representation in particular. Um, Marvel got a lot of flack at one point for how they interjected badly translated Arabic into the dialogue for the X-Men character Dust. Um, but they've gotten a lot better about their translations at this point. Now they frequently, I think you'll, you and I have both seen this in a couple of our papers lately, um, they are, and DC and Image and Dark Horse are putting in untranslated blocks of foreign dialogue frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important, you know, particularly we see this with Kamala Khan sometimes in, in Ms. Marvel. Um, but I want to point out that this isn't necessarily just an American thing. It's not necessarily even a corporate thing. This is something that's true, not just of comics, but sort of broadening, broadening our sequential art again. Um, it's true in newspaper, uh, newspaper cartoons and editorial cartooning as well. And I think that expand, we have to not just let ourselves get fixated onto the uh, comics thing. There's a great example from a uh, editorial cartoon in the Cardiff paper a man on a, a man on a street trolley, uh, you know, essentially berating a woman. It's like, you know, she's speaking in another language, uh, you know, ignorant man, you know, berating her saying, you know, we're, we're, we're in, we're in Britain. We speak English here. And it's, it's, a, of course, a, in the next panel is a hijab wearing woman. And the woman turns to him again, says something he does not understand. And the person next to the hijab wearing woman has to, has to chime in, uh, Sir, we're in Wales. She's speaking Welsh, and it, 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 this is what we are. Um, and I think it's worth noting it's not just something you're cherry picking. Sorry, that but, went on way longer than I intended. But I, I love, but I love that <laughs> idea, Lawrence. I love that idea of text, blocks of text that you can't read, and there's a continuity of you can't read it because you can't read that language versus you can't read it because you can't read, uh, and uh, and that that's playing out in comics in the present day, but going back 2000 years is a really fascinating trend to think about. Well, and that actually make, uh, uh, reminds me of something I wanted to ask you, Beth. You know, given that we're talking about extending these trends backwards and the difficulties occasionally in translating ancient languages, I know from some of your, your students' work that I've seen occasionally, translating those ancient, essentially ritual or spell books, um, 
are we sure of some of these translations even in these visual mixed sources? And does that add an extra layer to it compared to a modern language, do you think? Yeah, just very briefly, um, you know, I work on uh, magic handbooks from the fourth century uh, CE. And one of the ones I shared with you is that P. Oslo one that has the image and text. And for the longest time, scholars who could read the text, you know, the Greek uh, scribed on the papyrus said, well, those images are nonsense because they're not illustrating what's in the text. Uh, and uh, so they just like, just forget the images, they don't matter. Uh, but it, I think the comics vocabulary of thinking, wait a second, image and text do not have to be uh, interdependent. They don't have to be telling the same story for both to be meaningful, to drive forward a narrative or a ritual. Uh, so I, again, one of the many ways I think pulling this, this vocabulary and this, this mode of analysis into antiquity can, can be very fruitful. I think we have done an excellent job today of <laughs> of covering so much. Um, I don't know that we, we really came back to our prepositions per se, um, but I think we circled around them. You know, what, what exactly do we mean when we're talking about comics and history? And, and it's not just comics that talk about history, right? That, that comics themselves are history. Um, and and there there are these layers um, in the in the images in the written word in in the production in the placement in all of this that is that is really important for us to to bear in mind and to think about and find tools that are better suited for us and then we come back to this periodization question you know from the point of view of historians that want, especially world historians as we are, that want to look everywhere <laughs> and at everything, you know, we we do need to work to find better terms to to say the things we want to be able to say about this very broad um, category of items and of archive material that we have to work with. Um, we are getting very close to the end. I have been keeping my eye on um, the chat. It looks it looks like there's a lot of uh, approval of uh, Lawrence's capitalism is carnivorous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, are there any last minute thoughts or questions you want to take us out with today? Yeah, that you can I do in a minute. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> my my that, mouth is shut. <laughs> that if there is any place to start, because I think we talked about a lot of questions today, we, we gave almost no answers. But I would say that the first place I think we need to start, whether it's of, of, in, or as history, is figuring out new periodization definitions. I think that's one thing we kept circling around today. Um, whether we want to stick with the Hesiod model or come up with something new, and again, please don't let postmodern age be a thing. Um, whether it's Iridium age and Palladium age or whatever, I don't know. But we need a new naming nomenclature because some of these ones just don't work. I'll, I'll wrap up with, with our, our three prepositions that um, if, if we didn't stress this enough, there is no hard dividing wall between comics as of or in history. These are three really, th these are three lenses through which, you know, our, our group has tried to approach the study of comics that I think have been very, very productive. And it's, it's at the intersection of those three that good historical comic scholarship can happen. That's a great way for us to leave today. Thank you all so much for joining us um, and the, the really robust chat on YouTube. I've been enjoying watching that as well. Thank you. Go blue. <laughs> Out. Uh, I want to thank, thank the panel uh, for the great discussion. You covered a lot of ground, no pun intended. Uh, and you did so, I think, with a lot of clarity and uh, like everyone else watching the chat, people were really sparked by uh, your presentation. And hopefully we will continue this, um, this discussion because I, I too am really like intrigued by what would be a, a 
more accurate periodization. And I do like the, the idea of perhaps there could be uh, a continuing on with the sort of periodic table. I don't like iridium for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Please come up with another one. Then. I was <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, you know, earlier would be the platinum age. Right? Well, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll talk about this later. I think I think the the ages have a lot to do with um, well value, uh, which in itself becomes this uh, this question of like corporatization, right? Uh, but neither here nor there. We are in our break period. We're drifting off because we are, we're, I think, very much inspired by this great panel. Thank you again to all of you, all the, the great ideas that you presented here, um, the dynamic discussion that really got a lot of people talking, even though they didn't necessarily have questions. So you answered all their questions, or your questions were impossible to answer, one or the other. Either way, you succeeded in the uh, academic goal of getting people to talk <laughs> and think. <laughs> So thank you, and we're going to go on break, and we'll be back, um, and we'll have our short uh, second lightning round for today uh, when we come back at uh, 4.30. So thank you so much, and we'll be right back. Bye. <laughs>